Okay, the recording has started. Let's uh, get started. Okay, good morning and uh, welcome to our class today on Urban Church Planting, BC 309. We're going to pray and we get started and I think the others will uh, join us as we go along. Dave, could you please pray and let us start? We'll start. Sure, Pastor. Father, we thank you for this class and we thank you for this day and we thank you for this new week that you have given us, Lord Jesus, as we learn and to uh, hear from our pastor about the, the church planting, Lord Jesus, you uh, give us, give each one of us a vision, Lord Jesus, so that we can we can run after that vision and we can fulfill what you want us in our life, Lord Jesus, and so that we can learn and apply it in our lives, Lord God. We thank you. We will pray for all those who are still joining, Lord Jesus. Be with them and help them to join in time and help each one of us to study and understand more. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, once again. Welcome, Sudarth, Aaron. Thank you. All right. So, we, um, today we're going to start a new section, which is uh, section three on uh, urban church planting. So in um, section one, uh, we, uh, sorry, we, we did an introduction and uh, then we, so sorry, this is section four. So in section one was the introduction. Uh, section two, we did, uh, uh, some of the, the practical side of uh, church planting or starting a ministry in an urban location. And uh, section three, which we completed last week, uh, we talked about the spiritual side of things. You know, uh, how do we engage spiritually? Some of the things we have to be aware of in prayer and intercession and exercising spiritual authority. Uh, as we're going about doing our, our, our regular work of um, planting a church or starting a Christian ministry in an urban context. Today, we're going to start off section four. Uh, it's not a very long section, but I think it's, you know, it's probably a very important section compared to all the others. Uh, it has to do with personal preparation. Now, uh, usually, we, you know, we would have thought of putting this right in the very beginning, discussing this very beginning, but I thought I'd keep it to the end. Uh, and that's what we've been doing uh, is because, um, you know, having understood what, it, what, what is involved in starting a church or a ministry, the question ultimately comes back to, you know, how do I prepare myself? And am I, you know, does God want me to do something like this? So I kept this at the end so that you, you know, we could really discuss, we could talk, and you could take time to um, uh, think about this. And of course, if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask, um, which, you know, is more of at a personal level. You know, does God want me to go and start a church in a certain city? Or does he want me to start a ministry, a Christian ministry, some sort of a Christian ministry? It doesn't have to be big and so even if it's a small thing, that small ministry that's going to impact a few lives, uh, it could make a big difference in those few lives. And does God want you to do it? You know, maybe maybe there is a need, and nobody else is uh, addressing that need. Uh, does God want you to do something about that need, uh, which of course would may me would would require you to start a Christian ministry. So that's kind of the thinking uh, that we want to go along in, in this section, section four, and look at all of this at a, from a personal perspective. And then also share with you uh, some of the areas in which you can start preparing yourself. Uh, because starting a church or starting a ministry uh, is not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing. Uh, uh, there's there's a certain amount of uh, you know hard work, commitment, tenacity, grit, determination that's required uh, to make sure that uh, you know you can pioneer uh, a church or a Christian ministry. And so we want to just you know place that before you, so that uh, if the Lord was to, were to direct you to do something like that, you 
have a clear understanding that this is what it's going to take. Uh, and then you go into it, um, you know, as well prepared as you possibly can to pay the price to, you know, really get into it and make it happen. So uh, I've shared these uh, lecture notes with uh, on the classwork section, so you can take it from there later. I'm going to just uh, share it here with us. Um, so in this section, that we're talking about uh, the personal life of a church planter or somebody who's going to start a ministry, Christian ministry in the urban context. Uh, the first thing, of course, is to know that God wants you to do it, right? that God is calling you uh, to pioneer. That means to start something. Uh, and so, you you know, you always have the, the, the question, should I go and join something that's already there, maybe a church, Christian organization, so on? Uh, because in many parts of the world, uh, there are already in many cities, there are already churches, already Christian organizations that are functioning. So that is always an option to go and work with uh, an existing uh, church or a ministry. And there's nothing wrong with it. And, and, and existing churches and ministries do need more laborers, people who will, Christian workers will come alongside and be a part of it. So there's absolutely nothing wrong if, God, if you know, that's in your heart. But at the same time, uh, even within you know, in cities, even though there are many churches and there are many Christian ministries, um, there's always a need for more. Uh, because there could be areas of need, as I mentioned, uh, there could be areas of need that are not being addressed. Uh, there could be areas in the city that are untouched. Uh, there could be certain demographics or social uh, groups of people uh, that are not being reached or not being served. Uh, and just speaking generally, there are more people than churches can reach. So for example, you know, I'm just giving an example, say in Bangalore city, uh, let's say uh, we don't know the exact number, but let's say there are about 2000 churches in this whole city. Now 2000 seems like a big number, but the population of Bangalore city is anywhere between, you know, it's excess of 12 million people. Again, we don't know the exact population just because people are coming and going out. A lot, has, a lot of things have changed uh, in the last year and a half or so. But generally, before that, it was in excess of 12 million. It was 12 million plus growing. And uh, people were constantly moving into the city. So we're talking about, two thousand, let's say, 2,000 or so churches approximately. Uh, it's not an exact number. And we're talking about 12 million people. That's you know, a huge number of people to be reached. And uh, even these 2,000 churches that are already there uh, are not sufficient to reach you know, 12 million plus people. So there's even in, our, in this city, that in Bangalore city, there is definitely a need for more churches, uh, churches that address different languages, uh, because uh, uh, in our in the city of Bangalore, there are people who speak different languages, uh, different cultures, uh, different um, expressions. I mean, people have different tastes I mean, in the sense of what kind of worship service they would fit into. All of these di differences are there. And so there's always a need for more churches or more ministries, you know. Uh, when you, like we said, when you look at the city and you look at all the problems in the city, there's always a need for more people to come in and address uh, the problems uh, to help people you know, who are going through various challenges. So what, what I want to say is either way is fine. If God calls you to join an existing church or ministry, that's fine. If God is stirring in your heart to go and pioneer a church, or pioneer a ministry in a city or a certain place, that is also fine, you know. But the question is, what is God calling you to do? That's the real question. 
And so even when people come and ask, you know, should I join a church or should I go and start a church? We have to turn the question back to them and say, what do you feel God is calling you to do? Because there is no straight answer for every person. You know, the, 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 each one has to discover what is God calling them to do. So what I've put down here are uh, a list of pointers that you can consider that seem to indicate that you have the grace to start something. Okay, I'm not saying this is uh, that you this is that this list should dictate your decision. That's not uh, what I'm saying, but I'm saying that this list will help you think through uh, and maybe recognize that yes, you know there is a grace on my life to go and start something, whether it's a church or a Christian ministry, to pioneer, to do something uh, uh, you know, that may not have been done or that needs to be done and to take the responsibility of a pioneer and to do it, right? So what, what indicators of grace should we look for? First of all, uh, you know, you look for a pioneering spirit. That means, do you have... The, the inclination, the inner inclination to try something new, to be, you know, what we say is a way maker. That means you'll be the first person to chart the way, you know, so that means you'll have to make the way, to pave the way, uh, to try something that's not been attempted before. Uh, in some sense, are you adventurous? You know, are you willing to step out in, into the unknown? Are you that kind of a person? Is it, is it part of who you are? Um, there are some people who are good followers. That means they are very comfortable being behind uh, or just doing what they're told to do. Um, they're very happy if somebody gives them the work and they will do it well to the best of their ability. And we need people like that. Right? Uh, we need people who, who are good followers, who who are who are naturally inclined to be part of something bigger than they are and to serve in that very faithfully. We do need people like that. But we also need people with a pioneering spirit who are adventurous, who will be able to step out and say, hey, I I'm willing to do something new. I'm willing to try out something. Uh, I'm willing to be this person who would start something. We also need people like that. And so God has created all of us different. And, uh, and you know, uh, this is something that God may have put in you as part of your makeup. What I do want to point out is that sometimes you may recognize this pioneering spirit in you, you know, at a later point. Uh, initially, you may start out being a follower. You you just like that role. You just enjoy just being a good follower. You will do whatever is told you to do. Um, you that's it. You, know, you enjoy being that. You never think you may not have thought of yourself as a pioneer. But sometimes that pioneering spirit in you comes out at a little later stage. It could be that um, situations force you to take leadership. Situations force you to move out and start. And then you realize, hey, I, I enjoy this as well. I enjoy being able to try out something new. I enjoy being, you know, doing something like this. So uh, uh, this, this ability to pioneer may, may come out at a later stage in your life, and that's fine. Okay. But you need this. You need the ability to pioneer. That's an indicator that there is grace on your life to go and start a church or a ministry. Secondly, you should have the ability to work independently. Uh, usually a good follower or a good worker, uh, they, they do things that they're assigned to do. Somebody tells them, hey, do this, they'll do it. And that's good. We, like I said, we need people like that. But uh, in the case of a pioneer, there's nobody there to tell tell the pioneer, you know, go and do this, go and do that. Of course, you know, you can have some mentors, you can have some people who can give you some ideas, but ultimately they're not going to be there day to day to tell you what to do. Uh, 
So on a day-to-day basis, you have to think and give yourself tasks to do. You know, you have to be your own leader. Uh, you have to be your own manager. You have to get up in the morning and re- say that today I'm going to do this, this, this to, you know, uh, establish the church, to go forward. I have to try out this. I have to try out that. Um, or, you know, if it's a ministry, you know, I have to explore this and explore that. So those are things that have to come out from you. And of course, through your prayer and your relationship with God, these ideas will come, these directions will come. But you have to have the ability to receive that from God. Unlike somebody who's working in an existing organization, you know, uh, they are given, they're assigned work and their roles are described and um, they know what to do. They're told what to do. So that's the second point uh, you know, that you need to ask yourself. Do I have the ability to work independently? Uh, yeah, if you don't, and some people don't, uh, then you know, being a pioneer is going to be very difficult. Uh, you, may, you won't be able to take things forward. And uh, things may just end up stagnating, just being there, or sometimes uh, you know, just going around and around in circles because you're caught in a loop of doing the same thing because that's what you're comfortable instead of doing something different, doing something new, right? Uh, so that's the second grace you have to look for in your own life. And uh, uh, that's important. A third one is, do you have the ability to build bridges? That means, are you comfortable talking to people who are different from yourself, who are different from your background and culture, uh, can you sit down with them and you know talk to them, engage with them? Because when you're pioneering, when you're starting a church, when you're starting a ministry, many times you are stepping out to reach people who, you know, some of them may be like you, maybe in terms of culture, background, upbringing. But uh, you, there will be people who are very different from you. They come from different cultures, different backgrounds. Uh, but are you comfortable talking to them? Are you comfortable engaging with them? Are you comfortable listening to them? And, uh, uh, you know, uh, understanding different perspectives and different cultures. And then are you able to relate to them? See, that's important because, uh, like we said, even in a city, Uh, A city, most urban centers are a melting pot of uh, lots of different kinds of people. Uh, You can, in the city, say, look, I'm going to target a certain subgroup, a subsection. Example, you could say, well, I will will target people who are speaking a certain kind of language. Uh, It is good. You can start out that way. But it is very likely that if just being in the city and uh, even though you're, you have a target group, it's very likely you will have to engage with people from other cultures, other backgrounds. And sometimes uh, they may speak the same language, but they could be from a different city. Example, you know, suppose I say, uh, I wanted, and I'm just picking up a local you know, uh, Bangalore example. Uh, suppose I say I want to plant a church for Hindi-speaking people. That's good. So I have my target group by a language, Hindi-speaking. But just Hindi-speaking, there are people, you know, from so many different states in India who speak Hindi. And then there are people from different uh, cross section of society who speak Hindi. So there are the laborers who speak Hindi. There are the, you know, shopkeepers who speak Hindi. There are, uh, you know, very wealthy people who speak Hindi, uh, uh, and they are comfortable and they would like to have a Hindi church. So even though we have said uh, we want to do a Hindi church. Just that within Hindi itself, there are people who are from different states in India. People are, are doing different occupations. Uh, people who, are, who have different, uh, you know, uh, economic levels, and 
uh, and so would you be comfortable in relating to all of them? Can you sit with a, you know, a laborer uh, and speak to them in Hindi? Can you sit with somebody who's very wealthy, rich, affluent, and talk to them in Hindi? I mean, you've got this 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 wide gap, but are you comfortable just you know sitting with different people, different backgrounds, different cultures, and just relating to them as just human beings and talking to them and engaging with them. So this ability to build bridges is an important thing uh, to look for. Uh, if you're going to be a, 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 a church, you know, planting a church or starting a ministry, especially in an urban center, uh, because you are going to be involved with people from different backgrounds and cultures, and you should be comfortable doing that, right? So we've just talked about three indicators. Let me pause here and just make sure that uh, everybody's together. Uh, are you all uh, following me? You're understanding uh, these, these, these thoughts. Any questions? Y'all okay with me? Yeah, following? Kanan? Following? Okay, no questions, clear. Okay, fine. All right, I see your responses in the chat. And uh, yeah, feel free to you know ask any questions or any time. Um, okay, so I'm going to keep moving forward. Thank you for your responses. Um, let's go on. Okay, so we, uh, yeah, so these are just indicators. Yeah, I can do this. Uh, I have this grace. Number four is the ability to be a visionary. Uh, and, you know, like I said, um, uh, many of these things would be interconnected in some way. You know, obviously, obviously a pioneer is a visionary. But I just stated here uh, is, when you say a visionary, what does it mean? A visionary is somebody who has the ability to see something when nothing exists. Okay, that's a visionary. Uh, that's one part of being a visionary. So for example, you know, somebody shows you a piece of land, say, you know, you just make you, you're standing before, you know, a few acres of land, three acres, four acres, five acres, whatever. You're standing in front of the land. A visionary doesn't just see a land, piece of land, right? he will see, you know, maybe a big building, I mean, whatever, like, let's say in terms of a church or, you know, church building, uh, you know, he would see this beautiful big church building, he'll see the barking lot, he'll see people here and there. And, you know, for him, it's like, it's not just a, you know, a four acre plot or five acre plot, or whatever that is. But he sees something, he says like, wow, on this thing, you know, we could have all of this. So visionary seeing something, but doesn't exist, you know, Whereas, uh, 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 you know, as somebody who doesn't necessarily think along those lines, they'll see a three acre plot and they say, oh, yeah, yeah, I see three acres. Yeah, I see the boundary. I see, you know, whatever's on the on the land. And that's it. So they see what is there. But a visionary sees what is not there. And they're able to envision something happening. They're able, they're able to envision and of course, using the imagination that God has given to us, they're able to envision uh, people's lives being touched, uh, envision ways in which people can be reached, or people can be served. Uh, they envision people, their lives becoming better, uh, you know, people becoming happy, or people lives being transformed. Uh, so they're able to see that. And uh, most of us can, uh, can do that, and perhaps do that to some extent. But if you want to be a, a pioneer, if you want to be somebody who starts something, this vision or this ability to envision is very important. That's what is going to keep you going for many years when things are still coming together. Because you are seeing something way ahead of time. You're seeing something way into the future. And that vision propels you. That vision keeps you going. Uh, 
And uh, when you arrive at a certain level, then you begin to vision something more, something bigger. So you're going from stage to stage to stage. Um, a, a person who is not a visionary, they reach a certain level, they're very happy. Okay, fine, I've reached this, I'll still settle here. They're happy with that. So then what happens? Things begin to stagnate. But a visionary always keeps seeing something more. They always see something bigger. They always see like possibilities. They dream, uh, you know, in thin air, so to speak. They're always seeing, okay, how can I reach the city? How can I reach the nation, the nations? Uh, so the ability to envision, to see something when nothing exists is an important uh, indicator of grace. It's an important trait. Uh, you know, for somebody who is called to start a work, uh, to lead a work, uh, to pioneer a work, you need to have this ability. And of course, this is God given, you know, and the Holy Spirit breeds new visions, right? Remember that uh, uh, Peter, quoting from the prophet Joel, said that in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh, and your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. So visions and dreams are something that the Holy Spirit keeps birthing, giving to his people. And uh, and uh, of course, the, there are many aspects to visions and dreams, and one of them is that God is giving an understanding of what he wants to be done and where he wants things to go uh, in terms of the church or the ministry or reaching people or reaching the city, that so God gives this vision. And so being a visionary uh, is, again, a very important aspect of uh, grace. Now, I do, I do want to draw the distinction between somebody who gets excited and somebody who can envision a future and work towards it. You see, getting excited is good, but that excitement usually lasts for a very short time. But that is very different from somebody who envisions a future and keeps that vision in their mind or and keeps working towards it. So people can get excited, you know, and there's, oh, I'm going to go and I'm going to do this, this, and this. Uh, and they're very excited for maybe one month. And after one month, they stop talking about it. What happened to the excitement is all gone. What happened to all the plans and the dreams and it's all gone. So that was just based on excitement. That's not the same as envisioning a future. A visionary, envisions a future, of course, they are excited about that. But they keep that future in their mind's eye. They envision that future, even when the excitement is not there, even when things are very difficult, even when the, there are challenges, they're able to envision, that's where I'm going. That's where we are going. That's what we are working towards. It may take time, and of course, in church planting or Christian ministry, it will take, you know, some some of these take years, you know, uh, uh, and you have to stay fresh. You can't wear out, you can't, um, you know, become stale, you can't give up. And how do you do that? By make, keeping that vision fresh in your mind's eye, you know, that in, you're able to envision a future and say, that's where we are going. It's taken us so many years, but you keep, you continuing to go, we have to go there, right? So there's a difference between being excited about something for one or two months versus having envisioning a future and willing to work towards it over a long period of time. So that's the kind of visionary uh, we're talking about, right? Who, who, who's required to be able to pioneer a church or a start a Christian ministry. Okay. Number five, another indicator that I would encourage you to think about, consider is, uh, if, if you've had a prior history engaging in church plants or starting your ministries, 
Now, it could have happened uh, maybe when you were working with other people that together as a team, you'd gone out and you helped start something. You helped pioneer a work. So you were part of that team. Or maybe you led that team. Maybe you initiated that, however it might be. But if you have a history of doing this, that's a very good thing. It's a very good indicator because you have experience in pioneering, in starting something. What does it mean to break ground and start digging and laying the foundation and you know working on it? So that's a good indicator of, uh, of grace on your life. Uh, and uh, it's good to keep that uh, uh, as an important indicator that God has already prepared you through those experiences, whether you've worked with other people and done these things, uh, God has already prepared you to pioneer. He's taught you, he's trained you, he's already given you, uh, you know, uh, experiences that have prepared you to go and start something new, uh, either a church or a Christian ministry. Okay, a couple of more things uh, is a stirring in your heart. Right? That is also a very useful or a very important indicator that you feel really stirred about starting a church or a ministry. And the story can be, of course, due to various things. It could be because a certain need has really got your attention, it has, is really touching you. You know, maybe you're seeing that uh, there's a certain area where there is no church and there are lots of people there lots of houses there and people are not going to church because there is no church in the area in the vicinity and so they're just not going anywhere if so you feel stirred about it or it could also be where um, there's a certain need maybe there are children in the slums who they just not, nothing is being done to help them and uh, you, you, you're touched by it. You're being stirred by that. So that thing that's cap catching your heart and uh, has captured your attention is also something to consider, right? Because that doesn't happen just by accident. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of other people who are seeing the same thing, but it's not affecting them. But it is affecting you. So maybe God is using that. You know, get you to go and start a work, to go and do something, start a church or start a ministry uh, to address that need. Right. Number seven is there are times when God gives you a clear word from God. You know, you get a clear word. It could come through a dream. Uh, it could come a word that God speaks to you in your spirit saying, go and do this for my kingdom. Uh, it's, you know, you know that God has spoken to you, maybe through the scriptures, so, so many ways. It could be through a prophetic word, somebody prophesied, and it was then, conf you felt the confirmation, and uh, maybe somebody else gave the confirmation through a prophetic word. So, it, you know, maybe there's a clear word from God, a clear direction from God for you to go and start a church or start a ministry. That's also uh, an important uh, indicator to consider. And lastly, uh, you know, I just call this the accidental church planter. Uh, that means you were not really expecting this, but it just happened. And you find yourself in a place where you're starting something. You know, and uh, this is what happened. And one of the examples I think of is uh, how we started the Nepali church uh, at APC. Um, this happened back in 2001. Uh, this was the year that we had uh, actually started APC. We had just got back from the United States and uh, we that was end of December 2000. And January 2001, we started uh, All People's Church. Sorry, February 2001. February 18, 2001, we started All People's Church. 
uh, the English service. Now, at that time, in uh, we started this in my parents' house, and uh, at that time, there was a, a Nepali couple who were working in my parents' house. They were staying there, and they were working there. And so, uh, this young man had a, a young wife, and I think they had a baby as well. Um, uh, after about uh, after we started the English service, maybe after two months or something, he came to me. He said, "You know, there are a lot of Nepali people here. Uh, they don't have a church. Oh, can you start a church for them? Can you do a service, Nepali service for them?" Now, first of all, I I had never thought of something like this. Never. I didn't even know that there were so many Nepali people in Bangalore and there was a need for a Nepali church and all that. This was back in 2001. Now, uh, you know, so as soon as he put it, I, I was ready. I, I had no hesitation and uh, I, I didn't know too much about, uh, of course, I, I couldn't speak Nepali uh, and Hindi or anything, uh, but I had no hesitation. I said, sure, we can do it. The only thing is, uh, you know, we have to find a, a person who can translate from English to Nepali and we define some people who can lead worship. And uh, everything just fell in place, you know. So there were people there ready to have, translate from English to Nepali. So we started and this was on Tuesday afternoons at four o'clock. And uh, we went to a nearby place where we, we were very we same place with English services. We said, "Can you rent us a place for Tuesdays at four o'clock?" Tuesdays uh, were the day when most of the Nepali people had their day off; they used to work on the weekends. So that's how it started. And now, this was not something I had planned or I had even thought I would be doing. But we started the Nepali church every Tuesday, four o'clock. I would go. Uh, I would just pray and say, God, I hope the interpreter comes because if he doesn't come, service is not happening. <laughs> uh, I can't, uh, you know, I can't preach in Nepali or Hindi, but uh, without fail, every Tuesday, somebody was there and uh, there was somebody just saying Hindi and Nepali and people started coming. Um, then we had uh, somebody from one of the Bible colleges joined, and uh, he was there for a while, uh, working, uh, doing the, you know, helping interpret. And so God was very faithful. He kept on, you know, <clears throat> there was always somebody there for the Nepali church, and the numbers began to increase. Uh, and and the church was taking shape. But then I it it hit, it hit a point where I said, you know, I can't continue this. It's too many people, and I'm not really pastoring them because, uh, you know, uh, other than being there on Tuesdays and other than maybe helping with, you know, organize special things, uh, I, I really cannot talk to them. I really don't, can't help address their problems. Um, so we appointed somebody who would do that, you know, really like care for the people. And he was the person who could speak Nepali and all that. So he was doing that, but then he left. Oh, he, was, he was planning to leave. And so we were praying, say, God, please, we need a Nepali pastor. And I was ready to move out and hand this off to a Nepali pastor. And uh, sure enough, at that time, and I, I, I forget the exact year, I think it may be, um, I don't know, 2005, or I forget the exact year, uh, when we had uh, uh, Pastor Timothy Tapa. He came. He just, I don't know how and where he came, but he came from Kathmandu. I don't even know how this whole connection happened. Uh, but uh, you know, they brought Pastor Timothy up and said, hey, he's just come to Bangalore. He's, he's, he recommended that he will be the pastor. And it was all just a step of faith because I didn't know Pastor Timothy Tapa at that time or anything like that. But we just handed, so please take over. Please lead the church, be part of APC. We'll support you, encourage you. And so then the church just took off because there was somebody there full time to pastor the church and care for the people and then build it up. And of course, we were there to guide him and tell him how to do things and how to 
you know, nurture people. Some of the students started studying with us in the Bible college. They got trained and they started serving uh, in their own, you know, the Nepali church. So all of this it wonderfully worked out. But it all seemed to be an accident. If I look back, you know, there was a couple, Nepali couple working in my parents' home. They said, can you start? Now that couple left and they moved overseas um, uh, shortly after that. So, uh, but uh, I was just willing to step out and say, okay, fine. I, you know, however it is, we will serve. So sometimes, you know, uh, things like that may happen. And you just have to recognize that God is orchestrating something. You just go with it. You may not be the best qualified person. Uh, you may not have everything that it takes uh, to do it, uh, but you're just being available. And, uh, you know, to whatever extent you can help people, you help them. And then God will take it on from there. He'll bring the right people and build it and, you know, and, and, and bless many, many lives. So, I want to place these uh, eight, you know, what I, what we call as pointers, uh, things to think about, uh, as uh, and think about, and just you know, pray and say, God, you know, do I have these things in my life? Now, are there these indicators uh, that uh, that seem to indicate to me that yes, I can be a church planter, or I can be somebody whom God is calling to start a new work, right? So let's go over these eight things and uh, we will wrap up for today. So the first is a pioneering spirit, right? The ability to try out something new. Secondly, ability to work independently. Uh, you know, you have to be your own leader before you can lead other people. Lead yourself. Uh, thirdly, uh, the ability to build bridges, work with people from different backgrounds and cultures. Uh, number four is um, being a visionary, the ability to see something when nothing exists. Uh, number five, you have a history with God in engaging in church plans, or you have a prior experience. So that's a good thing. Uh, number six is uh, do you feel stirred in your heart? to start a church, to start a ministry, to address the needs of people. Um, number seven is uh, there could be a clear, confirmed word of direction from God. Uh, however, God speaks you know, through a dream, a vision, through the written scriptures, through a prophetic word, so on. Uh, number eight is maybe it's just an orchestration of circumstances that have just come before you and you find yourself in a situation where you have to step out and be a church planter or be a pioneer. And uh, and you pray about it, of course, uh, and you feel the peace of God, you know, then then proceed, take the step. And, uh, and God will bless that uh, step of obedience. Okay. So that's just the initial part on um, how you can recognize what you know that, that that God's put that grace on you to be a pioneer, a church planter. Any questions? Any thoughts? Any things you want to clarify on this before we close, please? Any questions? Anybody? All right, so take some time to think about these things. And uh, if, you know, either now or in the near future, God uh, speaks to your heart, hey, just, uh, you know, step out boldly. And we'll talk more on this uh, next class. So let's close in prayer. Uh, I see your comments in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's close in prayer and uh, we will then dismiss, okay? Um, Siddharth, would you like to close in prayer?
All right, I'm not sure if your mic is okay. Conan, is your mic okay? Close and proud. Close and proud. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead, Conan. For this afternoon, Lord, Lord, I thank you for the cross, Lord, Lord. Um, I'm praying for everyone in this cross, Lord, and uh, Pastor, Lord, thank you for the uh, knowledge and the understanding, Lord. Lord, um, help us more understanding. Uh, help us to get more understand. And um, yeah, uh, from the subject, Lord, Lord, uh, and I pray for uh, best of the day, Lord, to um, keep us strength. And, uh, protect us from our ways, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. I'll see you all again tomorrow. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you. God bless. Bye now.